Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Spencer Lee. I uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar for um, Adapt Builder version 2019, and happy holidays to all those um, folks there today. Today, we're going to cover um, some of the main features in this new version, Builder 2019. And before we begin, I'll just make a few announcements. Number one, if, if you don't mind, please keep questions to the Q&A period at the end of the meeting. Um, there is a chat box if you if you want to ask questions. If you don't have a microphone, you can type the questions into chat, and I will cover those questions um, pertaining to the webinar at the end if, if you guys are okay with that. Um, also, we will record today's meeting. It will be placed on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash adapt support. And there's a webinars playlist there where you can access the webinars that we conduct uh, for the different um, uh, different programs that we offer. So, uh, so the last announcement will be updates. So if you have not yet updated to this version of the software, we are currently working through updates. Um, you can always send us an email to licensing at adaptsoft.com or support at adaptsoft.com to request an immediate update uh, to get that process started. Uh, we do update um, clients on a staggered basis. So if you haven't seen anything yet, it's coming. Uh, we just we, ha we have to control the, the release in terms of being able to turn around the updates um, in a consistent fashion. So. Um, but if you want to get updated to this version immediately, just let me know. You can also email spencer at adaptsoft.com. So today what we're going to cover um, are just some of these, these new features for Builder 2019. We're going to talk about design strips and splitters. There's been uh, several improvements made to more rapid generation of design strips. Um, the, the usage of splitters, for those of you who have used the software, this is a kind of a pain point in learning the software, I think, and especially in developing your, your tributary region. So this has been greatly improved. The use of splitters has been really whittled down to just bounding off the, the width of a tributary, and we'll show that. We're going to talk about new options for generating and modifying um, design strips. Also, effective flanges for beams. In this version, you have the ability to model the um, to model a, a beam and also to utilize the effective properties of that beam for the purpose of the design of the sections passing through the beam. So that's a new feature we'll talk about. Design strip graphical reinforcement. There are now options to show provided, required base reinforcement as well as just the area of reinforcement per area of um, the section, just the row value for reinforcement. Then we'll go into more um, global analysis where we, we're going to show how, how the program handles P delta in terms of entering that into the model and what types of results do we get for P delta. Um, those get into the graphical reporting options for drift and moment amplification. And also for drift, this is relative to both, both first and second order P delta analysis we have uh, the ability to produce some nice reports in Excel now for drift and displacements. The last few things we'll talk about are just the modeling of ramps. How are ramps handled? What are the limitations with um, in ramps included in a model? We've made a few improvements. Uh, this is more of an ongoing project. I think you'll see even more improvements made for punching shear in the next um, release as well. This is uh, basically a stopping point, but there's been a couple of new improvements for punching shear, and then the ability to calculate losses, uh, long-term losses, and produce um, kind of batch reports for felt 3D. So essentially, you can model all of your tendons in, in Adapt uh, Builder, specifically Adapt Floor Pro, and you could use this program to calculate the long-term and the short-term losses uh, and produce reports for those losses. So if you, any of you are familiar with Adept Felt, that's a, the, just a standalone program that, that calculates losses. Essentially, we've embedded Felt into Adapt where you can process more than one tendon at a time 
for purposes of checking um, checking tandem losses. So we'll go ahead and get started. The first thing we'll talk about are the design strips and splitters. And um, one word of caution: if you're if you're going to be using the new version and you open a, an existing file in the new version, if you have a, a lot of splitters in that file, I would <clears throat> the first thing I would do is I would delete them. <laughs> okay, so splitters the way they've been used in the past is no longer and so there's a potential that splitters that are uh, opened in the latest version that they could actually cause you know harm to the uh, generation of the the support lines or the or generation of the design strips in this new version so we're going to go ahead and use this multi-story model for the main portion of the of the webinar and i'll go to single level mode we're going to just go to a two-way slab here. We'll look at something fairly fairly simple. I'll use level three as my example. And in this level, <clears throat> we're going to talk now about strips. So we'll go over to floor design. And in the previous version, I'll reference the previous version just as a matter of comparison. We, we generally would use the create X and Y strips just to manually generate strips, or we could use what was the old strip wizard. In this particular version, the strip wizard has been removed and it's been replaced with this dynamic editor. So you still have the option to, to modify or create support lines using these same tools. The difference being, if I just create a few support lines here, you'll notice I'm doing something that would, that would be likely a no-no in, in the current version, and that is I'm not going to add any splitters to this model, to what I've just added. When I generate the strips, the program now can determine where these strips end. So I don't need any splitters that bound the, um, let me go ahead and open this markup tool. I don't need splitters that really bound off the, the ends of the support lines that terminate within the slab boundary. That's no longer required. Um, the way splitters work now is splitters really just dictate how um, how wide a, a design tributary is along the length of the splitter. So if I wanted to limit, for example, this strip right here along this path so that the, the strip really was only this wide, let me change that color to pink, maybe it was this wide, then I would just add a splitter along that path and the program interprets that splitter and you can see it, it terminates the strip at that location. So splitters by and large will be used excuse me, in openings, like here. If I don't want anything to go on in this opening, I could use splitters and just add a splitter right there, there, maybe along these lines, and the program would terminate these, these strips at those splitters. So splitters are still functional, but they're not required in, in a kind of an intensive way that they have been in the past. Um, now, if I go ahead and dump these these support lines and splitters. I'll go over here and just select these from select by type. And I'm now going to generate strips using the new um, dynamic editor. So this editor will go through each of these different options. We have first the wizard. This is now where the wizard resides. And the wizard allows you to just create a, a construction line. And if you pass it through the supports, the program will just generate the the, the the strip. If you want the program to snap near the end at the endpoints of walls, you just need to snap near the endpoint of a wall. Okay, and that snaps back to the endpoint. Here, if I if I take this and I just snap to the center of wall, it's only going to snap at that point where I snapped inside the body of the wall. So, in this case, I might pause this and say, "Well, that's not what I really wanted." I'll go back and do this the proper way and snap near the endpoints. And now I have that snapped to those two points at the end of the wall. If you don't snap at the wall uh, whatsoever, then what happens is we just ignore the wall. So I'll pause this again, come back and redraw. If I go through column one, two, and then just go over here to column three, program doesn't care about that wall. It doesn't do anything uh, at the wall. So make sure you're snapping, <clears throat> excuse me, at the ends of walls or at somewhere in the body of the wall if you want it to pick up the wall as a location where you add a, 
uh, support line node. Go back here. And I'll draw that one back how we would recommend, which would be, again, something like, like this. Okay. And then we can finish this off in this direction. There's the, the next two. I'll switch over to the Y direction. And I could do this on one full path. If everything gets cut, it will pick up those as supports. If I if I don't want this support line to, to exit the slab at this angle, then what I can do is just click click here and then vertically up like so. And that will realign it uh, perpendicular to the edge or I guess in the orthogonal direction in this case. Okay, and then we'll do the last set of columns here. And that's that's the generation of support lines for this example. Now, I want to avoid having the cuts go through the openings. So I'll, I'll use an X splitter. And the splitter I'm just going to add along this path and over here along this path. Oops, let me back up. I'll just snap on the corners of those, those walls. And then I'll use Y splitters to to bound out the other uh, direction. Okay, and the Y splitters are interpreted by the Y support lines. The X splitters are interpreted by the X support lines. And when I generate my strips, this is what I end with. And if I isolate those, you can see there's very little uh, correction needed to be made in this case. I mean, th these are these are nice support lines, usable support lines without having to go back and iterate through <laughs> multiple corrections using splitters. So the only splitters we have are really to bound out this this uh, this opening in this core area. Um, now, <clears throat> one other item that's that's useful in the in the dynamic editor is this wall item. We in the program, if a design cut extends over a wall, the program, if it's a post tension slab, for example, we don't report stress when a cut extends over a wall, and we actually don't we don't design that that uh, section for strength reinforcement. For any strength load combination, it's only designed for service or minimum reinforcement. So let's assume that we don't want these cuts to extend over this wall. I have two ways of handling this. I could, first, I could just leave the, the strip as is, the support line passes through the wall, and there's this new option for wall boundary. And what this option does is this allows us to add um, boundary conditions for walls relative to the generation of strip, uh, st the, the generation of the design strips. If I say for this wall here and here in the X direction, I do not want the program to cut the sections over the wall. So I'll go ahead and just say, I'm gonna select user defined. I'll def define these as an X only boundary. So I'll just click on the wall and specify the boundary. I'll close that. When I regenerate the strip, Notice that the program creates a very small section over the wall automatically. You would have had to do this with splitters in the previous versions of the software. And notice it sticks out some tiny distance and then the sections above actually extend all the way down to the wall. So this is, this is one way of handling this, but I might, I might say, well, this, this, this integration line is too long. I don't want to integrate a section that long. So that's fine, we can just take this um, support line and just move it slightly outside of the wall. So once I have a support line away from the wall, but the wall is still a boundary and I regenerate, now I, I get a cut down towards the face of the wall, but I don't get anything over the wall. If you still wanted to have results over the wall, I would have to add another, another support line along here. Okay, so this is this is an example of how we can define wall boundaries to our walls so that the program doesn't cut strips over, over, these, uh, over these wall locations. One example that, that this, this core example is probably not the best example that illustrates this, but if you had a wall, let's say, um, away from, let's say you have a wall here. Let's see if I can get that properly input, I'll turn off my snap tools, come back to it. So I'll, I'll just add a wall right there. 
And we, we want a support line over this frame line, a support line over this line here that we've added. I'll actually move this back down to the wall location. And I, I just don't want this wall to be cut by any of the sections from above or from the sections below. So I can just go and define that wall as a boundary. I'll come back to the floor design under dynamic editor and say I want that wall to be a boundary for, again, the X direction. You could assign X only, Y only, X and Y, or I just say no boundary. I'll just deal, deal with it manually through use of splitters maybe. So I'll define that as an X. And again, if I regenerate the strips, the program just cuts out away from that wall. You'll notice this big gap right here. The, per, the reason there's a gap there is because this wall is also um, a boundary. So if I, I, needed, I need to go ahead and deselect that as a boundary in this case, I'll go back to user define and say this is no boundary. And now when I generate the cuts, these now extend up to this face of wall, these extend down to this face. So for wall intensive models, this may be helpful when generating the cuts uh, and you know, generating the strips for your, for your slabs. A few other options in this dynamic editor, limits. This just allows you to check the, um, the criteria of the support line. So rather than have to, having to double click and changing the criteria, I could just change the criteria here. Maybe I want to change these all to one way. So I'll just, you know, window select or select the different support lines. That's probably not what I want. So I'll go back to two way. And you can also uh, enter a limit of tributary width on both sides of a support line. So if I, if I say I want this to be limited to five feet, this support line here, uh, let me make sure I okay. I don't know why that's not oh I need to select that. I forgot to do that. So there's my five foot limit. And when I regenerate this strip, this just gets limited to that distance on either side of the support line. This might be useful if you're doing middle strip and column strips in the same model. And you want to you want to force the tributary width to either side. The last option in the dynamic editor is under display. So this really just displays criteria, uh, direction, and limit. And I can update that, and that will just show up on the drawing, so you can see what you have specified for your support lines. Okay. Um, we'll now talk about beams. Something just happened while I turned my head away from that. Let me go ahead and open that again. Okay, we'll talk about uh, how the program will handle the, the beams. If I, if I have a beam along a couple of these frame lines, let's go ahead and model uh, two beams here. So I'll go from here over to there and something like this. And going back to the dynamic editor, at beams, if we, if we use the construction line and we snap near the end points of the beams. Now, if I snap at point one and all the way over at point two, it's not going to work because these beams are actually segmented. There's actually one and two, so I need to snap near point two of beam one, near point one of beam two, and then point two of beam two. And then out, the program will break this up. So this strip becomes a two-way slap strip. The next strip is actually a beam strip. This becomes a beam. The program just classifies it because it recognizes the beam. The nice thing is we do not need any uh, splitters. So coming back to my example from earlier, in, in the previous versions of the software, I would have to add a few splitters here to make this beam stuff work out because I stopped points inside of the slab boundary. In this version, that's not required. You can see this becomes one beam strip, this is another beam strip, and this becomes two-way slab and two-way slab. So 
for beams, the program also gives the ability to uh, design the beams using effective properties. So the integration length for this beam is from here up to the edge of the slab. But if I wanted to limit the actual design and the stresses and the, the different uh, output that I get for the, for the beam design, I could take this beam and I could say, I want to um, go into general options and use effective flange. So this uses ACI and European code effective flange, depending on what codes are selected. With that selected, you can choose whether or not you want to include the contribution of both post-tensioning and reinforcement outside of the effective flange for the rebar calculations. So those options are shown here. If I store that, and I'll just run through a quick uh, analysis of this floor. So let's analyze here for strength, uh, dead and live. And I need to remesh, I forgot about that. Beams are in place, I added those, so there was already a mesh there. If you add components, you should remesh the slab. Okay, and then I'll go ahead and and analyze. And I'm going to design this this uh, beam number one and beam number two. So I'll select those only and design those. You'll notice for beam one, I had selected effective flans. Let me reset the view here. So when I go into the design sections, you can see that the actual integrated length is 145. The effective length is 63.5. So the program is using the effective properties based on that effective flange to design this and to calculate stresses. For this beam over here, the, the length is 151 and the effective length is basically 151 also because we're not using effective flange for this beam. So that, uh, that option is available now in the software. Um, if we go up to plane six, you can see this is this is a level that has a lot of beams. So we, we could still use the same dynamic editor functionality. We just have to be a little more careful on a level like this where when I'm snapping, this is a continuous beam. So I can snap near point one and two of this beam. This beam is broken up into two. So if I want the program to automatically break this up, I have to snap on the interior points like so. And then I might, you know, do a wall uh, location. I'll just do another beam location and so on. So you could use this to generate strips even in a grid structure where you have a lot of beams. It might be a two-way slab with beams on all frame lines, or it could be a one-way slab with beams and so on. So this is a nice tool. It really saves a lot of time once you get used to using that um, in generating your design strips. Okay, we're going to um, <clears throat> show one more thing related to single level. I'm going to go back down. I think we were at plane three. Let me make sure. Yeah, plane two. So at plane two, let's go ahead and just design. We already have a solution stored for this level. I ran it analytically in single level mode. I'll come back to it and I'll actually design all of my strips. One thing that's new for reinforcement is if we go over to the result browser and under design sections, there's this new option called reinforcement right there. It's under investigation. This option will show me the graphical area of steel on all of my support lines. So the required area of steel for this combination strength is shown graphically in this view. The, the, we have top rebar, which is green, bottom rebar is blue. And I'll go ahead and use my settings to change the font height. So this is a nice graph if you're interested in seeing how much reinforcement is needed at certain locations in the slab. I could toggle between, you know, X and between Y. Uh, I only have X now in this in this slab, but uh, you can also check the provided reinforcement. So if I want to know, well, this is based on what's required per calculation, but what what's the reinforcement based on required or based on provided, based on what adapt is 
shown me and put in the slab. If I select this, it says generate the rebar for this combination. So we need to generate the rebar first. I'll go here to calculate, generate for strength, dead and live. Once I've done that, you'll notice what happens to the graphs, they get linearized. They're not based on a per point basis. If I go now and, and select this, and I'll turn off the first option, this is what's provided. So you can see if I overlay those, th these bars get stretched out by the program. So there's a lot of reserve over on the sides at the bottom, uh, you know, where I'm hovering my mouse. And this is a nice way to just check where you have demand and where the program is adding reinforcement as well. Um, you can look at base reinforcement. If I added, for example, a bottom mat of steel to this slab, I'll go ahead and do that under rebar. We will add, uh, actually, let me close out of that. I'll select the slab, use mesh wizard, and I'm going to do a bottom mat of number fives at 12, let's say. Once that's done, I have to redesign the sections to capture that new rebar in my design cuts. So I'll redesign my sections. And now if I look at the base, this shows me the, the area of steel in each section per the base um, rebar. I could go back to calculate it. This would be in addition to base. So you can see these two graphs actually dropped quite a bit because now we have this amount of base rebar in the section and it's adding this amount of rebar on top of the base. And then finally, you can look at the percentage of steel in the section. This is for the calculated rebar. This, this is not for base reinforcement. This is per calculated rebar. So it would basically be equivalent to the, the required rebar divided by the area of the cut. All right, so those are some of the changes changes we've made that are, I think, more applicable to single level mode. We're now going to transition into um, multi level mode. So let me go ahead and clean the screen here. I'll move this thing out of the way. I'll remove. I'll just keep those beams. That's fine. And we'll go. We'll switch over here to multi level analysis mode. We're going to first talk about p delta. So the program now considers um, second order uh, analysis, P, big P delta, I'll say, and it, we, we use, we do not use the, the iterative method. We use a non-iterative approach where we calculate a geometric matrix and use that for the solution. Uh, if we go to loading load combinations, you'll note that there's now a new option here, which is called P delta. So whenever you mark a combination P delta, the program is going to check and it could potentially take longer depending on how big the model is and how you set the combinations up. And I'll describe that. We have two, two ways to really frame the combinations. We can, we can run singular solutions for each P delta combo. I'll call it S and we can run batch solutions called B. Singular solution would mean that if all of your P delta combinations are unique, meaning they don't, they they have, uh, they may have the same load factors for gravity, but they have a different load factor for a lateral load case. The program would actually solve each one independently, meaning it would have to converge on a geometric matrix three times in this case. If you want to run this in batch mode. The program allows you to do that if you set the combinations up a certain way. The combinations are not required to be in sequence, by the way. I'll describe that here in a moment. But in this case, we have what's called a master combination right here. This is master PDM1. And that basically is just my sustained factored level gravity loads. So we have 1.2 dead plus one live. And You'll note that I have two additional P delta combinations, PDSX and PDSY. Those have identical load factors as the master combo. The only difference is we, we add a EQX and an EQY. 
So when the program sees this type of arrangement where the master really only includes factors on, a, on the gravity loads, but the other combinations have the same factors, the program solves the geometric matrix for the master, and then it reapplies that to these other uh, combinations with EQX and EQY. And so it doesn't have to solve the same matrix three times, it solves it once, and then it can essentially solve these last two with the same, um, with the same matrix in place. So again, if you do not want this to, to, to be solved that way, you want it singular, singularized, I could actually just remove, I could remove this, and then the program would just, you know, do these two independent of, of each other. By me adding this PDM1 combination, I can then batch process those, those, um, those load combinations. You can have more than one master combination. I could have another one. I could say I want I want PDM1 and then I want PDM2. And in this case, I might you know do 0.9 times dead load, and then I would do PDSX2, PDSY2, and I'd have 0.9 again in these cells, and maybe I do one and one again, or or 1.2 and 1.2, whatever the combination is. You could have more than one set of master and and uh, secondary combinations that the program can process. They do not have to be in order. The program just simply scans. If all of this was filled up with, um, if all of this was filled up with combinations that were all set to P delta, the program would just scan those and determine which ones it can lump in batches, and then it would process. If they're all unique, you would have you know 10 to 15 combinations being solved independently. So that's how that's how you set the combinations up. The next thing is how what types of results can we get from from the p delta? Well, p delta uh, results can be used for column design. They could be used for wall design. They're just like any other combination. You're just getting amplified actions for those combos. What you cannot do in the current version with a p delta combination is you cannot design uh, slab strips or beams. You you can you can review the the actions for p delta but we we actually suppress the design of sections for these combinations the combinations are still only designed for service and strength not for p delta column design and wall design can be designed for p delta but not floor uh, or beam designs uh, basically design strips that you that you set up in the model actions can be viewed for those strips however so there's a couple of other nice features here. I'll go ahead and just close that. And we're gonna run the analysis of this global structure with, with the P-delta combinations in place. So we'll go to analysis. I'll just select my set of combinations. Now in, in, in the codes, usually it references you to running P-delta at the, the point of, of overload or below that point, let's say. And so that means you probably would run P delta with, with cracked stiffness modifiers for your components. In this case, I'm not doing that, I'm just using uncracked. But you can use usage cases in the program to set up a set of modifiers that you would wanna run and process the P delta combinations for. Just, just an FYI, we have that capability That's that was released back in, I think, 2000 and. Uh, maybe 15, um, maybe even before that, 2012, but that's available. Here, I'm just going to run it as uncracked. We'll go ahead and solve this this model. This model takes just a minute or so to solve. If anyone has questions while this is solving, this may be a good time just to maybe dump some of those in chat, and I'll see if I can pick up one or two of them now. Otherwise, we can sit here in silence. <laughs> so, once this is done running, we're we're going to talk about the graphical results that you can gain from from the these p delta um, combinations. 
And those are mainly over here under analysis column drift and moment. So we're going to talk about drift and moment amplification factors uh, that we can check graphically uh, for these these elements in the model. This mesh, I meshed this model at seven feet, so that's a pretty coarse mesh, but the model runs fine. It's stable and um, no issues there. But if I was actually doing this for design, I'd probably back that down to four or five feet for the mesh or even less. Okay, this is done. Now what I'll do is isolate my columns to show uh, the graphical results. Okay, we'll go back to visibility, default display. I wanna get rid of all those elements and then I'll go to column design and just isolate the columns. And I'm going to go to the roof level, plane 28, and we'll do single level mode here. There's one question here. So um, if the question is, if I remember correctly, for usage modifiers, you had to adjust E to modify ICR and strong direction of the wall. Is that still the case? Uh, yes, there's no current modifier for um, bending wall bending about the S axis. That's the strong axis. So if this is a wall in plan, we have, uh, we have R. I'll, I'll do it this way. We have a wall. This is R and this is S. If that wall rotates, the axes rotate with it. So bending about S, we have no modifier for that. I believe we have modifier M11 and M33, which is kind of a, about the Z axis. Uh, Steve, that's that's coming. Uh, that's something that we're, we're aware of and we need to add that in. So it's been documented as a priority item for um, for global mode. I can't tell you when, but it has been documented. So um, back over here at the result browser, if I go to column drift, you'll notice that if I have a combination selected <clears throat> that is not P delta, these amplification factors get turned off. That's that's also the same for moment. If I go to action moment, um, here the amplification factors get turned off. The amplification is judged against, it's basically code checked, if you will, against these values in display. I have maximum moment amplification and maximum drift amplification. They're defaulted to 1.4. This just might be an indication of the stability if there is a stability problem uh, in the structure. So you, you can modify this, user-define this value um, for your amplification factors. If I do select a P delta combo, so in the loads table, there's a new classification called P delta. And let's say I pull out P delta S in the X direction. So this is seismic in the positive X direction with some decent uh, like torsion, I think 5%. And having selected that, if I go back, now you'll see that these actually get turned on. So the program will report for this combination selected, I can report the, the combined drift, which is really just the global displacement, um, differential top and bottom. I can, I can look at the X direction, Y direction independently for this combo. And I can also look at amplification factors. So for for second order to first order ratio of drift, what's the percent difference? And you can see at this level for combined amplification, it's 4%. If I look at individual directions, you know, they will update that result to show that, that value. Um, and we can do this globally too. If I turn on the entire structure again, I can check my uh, amplification here. The amplification is actually okay. This is all under 1.4, but the um, uh, not, well for the, for this for this combination it's not. Let me see if I update that. I'll go back here. Yeah, right here this flags it as no good. So it's the y direction that was flagging this value no good. The x direction looked uh, or the let's see we're in the y direction now. 
or the Y direction load P, PDSY, and then the other one's PDSX. So these get updated as you select the different combinations. And then the maximum values are shown here. So we have some location where the, the ratio of second order to first order drift is uh, for the Y direction is 50% that might cause alarm or you know the user to go and check that and see where that that location is and all of the columns will have a value for that ratio um, you can also check bending moment amplification so bending about r and bending about s we can check again for any p delta combo what's the what is the amplification and moment between first and second order analysis this doesn't directly tell us what the actual moment is. Clearly, I could say, well, for this combination, if this is 15% over and this is moment about R, I could turn on moment about R and it would stand within reason that if I took the value and I decreased it by 15%, that would give me the first order moment. Or one thing I like to do with these combinations is I've set up two combos, seismic X and Y, which correlate to PDSX uh, and PDSY, these would just be my first order solutions. So I could I could go and select, this is, uh, let me go to a wireframe view. Actually, I'm gonna navigate down a couple levels here. This is just easier to see the moments and I will go to um, wireframe, so under visibility, Okay, so this is the moment about R for PDSX. If I go to amplification, this is 1%. If I come back, moment about R and just switch the combination over here to one of my first order combinations that I had set up, you can see that this is 182 and P delta was 184. So really, really close just showing you how you can investigate some of the results because the the amplifications are just a little bit indirect um you know if if you're wanting to see actual moments you have to have a combination that has produced those results for you so that's th those are some graphical results that we can obtain from just the p delta and the the second order analysis you could also go to column design and if we go to design settings you still have the ability now to design directly from these p delta combinations so rather than using moment magnification which was something that our partner program s concrete was using moment magnification for non-sway frames it actually relied on second order analysis for sway design and now we can you know we can satisfy that requirement where you can set up your P delta and di directly design for the actions relative to those combinations by just simply selecting them in this dialog. The, the process is the same. There's another question here. Is, uh, is it usual, usual to use walls and frames with beams to resist lateral action due to wind and earthquake? Um, So the, the question is, I mentioned earlier that we, we do not design beams for the P-delta effects. We do, um, we do, however, report the actions. So the question is, how, how can the beams be designed to consider lateral actions? If you want to design the beams for P-delta in a primarily sway frame where they're participating in the lateral analysis, you would have to take the actions out of ADAPT and design them outside of the program currently. Um, or you can determine the, the amplification factor, for example, and scale up the factors on the first order uh, combinations to get that same uh, same moment. I mean, there's different ways you could you could quote unquote trick the program to do that, but um, we're I think we're on par with other programs in the same space that um, in the sense that you know I don't I don't know exactly what other programs are doing, but I know we did investigate it. And for the most part, um, we found that primarily the vertical components, the columns and walls were being designed with the P delta, but not necessarily the, 
the beams. But I agree, Giordano, uh, you, the, the code is pretty specific. It says the beams, um, you need to account for the secondary actions in the beams or the, the second order actions in the beams. It was just a programming decision at the time we developed it. So with that, that can be changed and improved as time goes on. Okay. Um, drift, there's a new report available for drift under reports. Uh, this, this applies to both first and second order. This is not necessarily, you don't have to run P Delta to get this report. You could do it otherwise just for first order. So under analysis data, drift report, this will allow the user to select the combinations you want to check. And I'll just check one of these for sake of time here. But if I take that PDSX and I set up my allowable code check values for allowable and amplification, I can then select my directions. This will dump a PDF, or excuse me, an Excel report for um, for my structure. Now, this this is some good information that has been difficult to obtain in the program previously. So the first thing I'll kind of describe each one of these tables and charts. The first thing that we show is the from top down, every column and the coordinates of the columns and the story height. So the, if you're ever looking for column coordinates for any post-processing of data, you can always come here and dump this report. This will show you what those coordinates are. Um, we, displacements, these are just the raw displacements for the combination that I selected. So at column 251, plane 28, for the combination PDSX, I have a top and bottom X and Y and global displacements shown here. So these are just the raw displacement results. The drift at columns, again, the same structure to the table. We have the list of columns top down, the load combination name, and then we take the drift, the, the differential in the X direction between top and bottom. If we take this displacement, 8.67 minus um, bottom 7.91, we would obtain 0.77. So that's drift X, Y combined, and then the percentage. This is this value divided by the story height in a percentage form. So if any of these values are ex exceeding the allowable, we show the status check here, no good. And you can go down the building and look at your columns for um, this particular combination for this example. Average drift is basically taking all of the columns at a, at a level and finding the average. So we just take the average drift for, for all columns in X, Y, and combined directions, and also check drift per the story height again, per the average. So this is an average value. Maximum drift envelope, this would be um, just the maximum at each level. So here we're just showing a percentage. This is just represented as drift, maximum drift at any level for X, Y combined. Average drift envelope would be the, um, the envelope of combinations. So I only selected one combo. Therefore, the average drift envelope and the, the drift, these really would be the same because I've, I've only processed one combination. But if you had you know, 50 combinations, this would give you a better view of what's happening relative to all 50. And then if you do run P delta and you select a P delta combination, we show the amplification table here as well for X, Y, and uh, combined amplification of drift between the first and second order based on this P delta combo. So this is um, th this is much easier to check. In previous versions, all of the drift checking had to be done through the code check or through trying to obtain displacements based on the slab contour or the column displacement points um, graphically, which is still there. I mean, it's still useful, but we just offer another option here to obtain some of those results. Okay, so that's that's P delta and drift. Um, in a summarized form. The next thing we're gonna talk about is ramps. Uh, the program can 
handle ramps to a to a degree okay and that degree is that the the program does not design ramps yet you can model ramps for purposes of just analytical consideration we cannot design the ramp we cannot add post tensioning yet to the ramps or they're really there just as a model component so in this case let's assume we have this parking structure and if i go to a side view there's four or five levels here and i basically want you know a ramp on this side and then a ramp on the opposite side something like this so and i i, I might want to do this because this I need the continuity of the ramp for purposes of lateral analysis in the program. This was really hard to do in previous versions. You would have to simulate it through stepping and connecting elements, and it became tedious to manage that and to make it work properly. So let's go back to a plan view, and I'll navigate back to level two here. When I go to model, there's this new option for ramp. The first two points define the top of the ramp, the second two define the bottom of the ramp. So I'm at level two, which goes down to ground. And if I select, for example, point one and point two, and then at the bottom, point three and four. Notice when I go to point four, this actually gets locked because the ramp has to be planar. It can't be warped. So we lock out this last point and there's my ramp. Okay, this is actually going from level two down to ground. If I go to the opposite side, I want this ramp really to go up um, or, or actually to go down the opposite way here. So we're gonna go and I'll do this the opposite side. I'll go from here over to there. Oops, let me try that again. The snap tool is a bit sensitive here, so there's the ramp on this side. Now, if I go to a 3D view, this is currently what my ramps look like. Nothing, you know, too spectacular other than you can model the ramp quite easily now. And I might want to copy those up. So if I just take these and copy, they're like any other component. Let's see if I can move that point. So I'll take these two ramps and I'll copy them vertically. So we'll go to visibility, or excuse me, to modify vertical copy up, and I'll copy these up three times. And now if I go to multi-level mode, I have this uh, structure which has ramping on all levels. Now let's say we wanna introduce, uh, we wanna introduce a um, beam along the edge of the ramp or a beam transverse to the ramp. Let, let's do both. So if we, and I'll go back to single level mode, level two to model this. So I'll, I'll first model the beam transverse. And we'll go to beam. And um, I'm going to model that across here. Now I'm modeling at level two. So the, the, the beam is really not in the plane yet of the, it's not dropped down to the plane of the ramp. It's still at level, at level two. And I'll also add something that looks like this. And I'll, I'll show this on just this one level here. Okay, so if I go to a 3D view, you can see, by the way, I'm gonna select those two ramps. If I right click, there's now hide and show selection. Just, you might be interested in that, I'll hide that and I can right click and show all. So that's that used to be done only through visibility. That's now a right click option. We're adding more options there. So notice these beams are actually above, you know, I want them to be aligned with the ramp. So what I'll do is I'll just select the components. I'll go over here to model and I'll say connect to ramp and those get automatically connected down to the ramp component. Okay, and we'll go back to uh, visibility. And you can see those elements shown like so. The program was also uh, modified to be able to handle the meshing of the, of the beams that drop down below the midpoint of the column. That was an issue when you were trying to step ramps in simulation. 
So we've done a lot of work on being able to handle the meshing of the ramp and being able to handle just the analysis of the ramp. But ultimately, um, the ramps are there only for analytical purposes. If you try to draw a, a section cut, if I, for example, draw a support line along here, the program will automatically just cut that off at the ramp. You wouldn't have a, a section cut that goes through uh, this space. So these are kind of treated as, as openings, automatic openings when we when we look at them uh, for purposes of design cuts on the main slab. Um, we're gonna move over now to punching shear. So for ACI, Specifically for ACI, if I go back to my other model, let's go to this two-way slab model. And I'll go ahead and let me turn off some of these options for display. Okay, we'll take this level, for example. If we go over to floor design, shear design, there's two new options, or actually three that have been added. There's this option for consider critical section outside of the shear reinforced zone. If you boil that down, that just means the program now checks critical sections based on this octagonal shape. In previous versions between ACI 318.11 and prior, the program would always use a rectilinear shape for all critical sections. The program now has the ability to, to calculate it based on this shape, which is explicitly required in ACI 318. Um, 14 based on your rail arrangement, which is hard coded into the program like so. So if we have this rail arrangement, the program or the code says you have to check the least critical section at D over two in this pattern. And this option would allow you now to do that. This edge distance to rail or stirrup line is just the distance from the edge of the slab to the, to the rail. Uh, or to the, it's, yeah, it's to the, it's actually to the center line of the studs in this case, or the center line of the stirrups. Uh, question about the ramps. Let me just pick this one up. Will the beam under the ramp be designed for the self weight of the ramp as well? Uh, if we could design the beam under the ramp, it would. Yeah, the program considers all self weights, so the self weight of the beam is considered for the analysis, but again, Anna Soya, the even the beams at the ramp would not be designable in this current uh, version. Anything connected to the ramp is there only analytically, not for design. Um, there's also an option here to apply minimum reinforcement for drift. So if, if you have seismic requirements where you have to you have to reinforce uh, for for punching shear, you have to reinforce within three and a half square root F prime C. The program allows you to check that also. That's this option, apply minimum reinforcement for drift. We have a new technical note that covers all the details of this, um, these, these two checks. But if you select those two checks, those are just applied to the general punching shear analysis that had been improved in the previous version, 2018. And so you may want to go back and, and review some of those notes and um, and that technical note. If you're interested, we can add that to, I believe it's on our website now, but if not, you can contact support at Adaptsoft and obtain that. Okay, the last thing we're gonna look at is felt 3D. And let me go down to level, um, let's go down to level two. And at level two, actually, let me go up to level three. I'll turn on my tendons here. So if I double click on a tendon under stressing, you can see this stuff here has been added. If Even if you were using calculated force method in the previous version, the program would require the user to enter a lump sum long-term loss. We now can consider that uh, specifically per calculation of long-term losses. If you select this option, if you go back to effective force, both of these get turned off if you use calculated and you have the PT shop module enabled. Right here, I have the shop module enabled, which is just part of the splash screen. That's shown right here. If that's enabled, 
then the user can um, can choose to calculate the long-term losses. If you if if that option is disabled, you can still only use estimate lump lump sum uh, loss for long term. Once you've actually gone through and and specified whether you're using calculated or not, and whether you want to calculate the long-term losses, you could check the friction and elongation. And then we have reporting options here to to basically produce a report for the long-term losses. It's similar uh, to the felt report. It's just been updated and modernized into an HTML um, format and also a PDF format. So I'm not going to produce it here because I have several tendons. It will take a little too long to produce, but this allows you to produce um, the report for, for your long-term losses. So that's the uh, content that we were going to cover today. I'll, I'll go ahead and open it up for any questions that anyone has. Um, so if you don't mind just typing the question into the chat box, and I'll see what we can do about getting those answered. If you don't have any questions, I appreciate everyone's attendance. Again, happy holidays, and uh, you're always welcome to contact us at support at adaptsoft.com for you know questions that might arise on specific uh, projects with any issues you have with the software or just feature uh, requests or feedback. Okay, no no questions. Oh, there's one. Uh, yeah, Sam, the, the ramp would be considered part of the overall um, floor diaphragm. So it you would have some continuity based on the fact that there's a ramp connecting one level to another for, for general lateral analysis. The I guess one of the limitations and drawbacks is really the ramp provides you just with a sense of raw analytical results when it gets into design of those other components, then you you have to, especially at the ramp level, you would have to use other means to design the ramp. But an analytically, it would be considered as part of a kind of a continuous multi-level diaphragm, if you will. Another way to answer that, Sam, would be um, you would you would see lateral uh, you know lateral action in plane, lateral action in the in the ramp element uh, for for a lateral analysis. Other other questions. If there's no other questions, um, I'll wait here another minute or so just to see if anything else uh, comes up. If not, again, you're welcome to exit and and then you can pick up the recording at youtube.com slash adapt support if you're interested in the recording. Uh, the question is, do I recommend running the P delta with a master combo? I, I would say yes. Um, typically, if you're going to be running P delta, that would mean you're going to have a multi-story analysis anyway. And for the most part, the geometric matrix is driven largely by the sustained load in the in the axial, you know, tension compression forces in the vertical components. Th those are affected somewhat by the lateral component, but not not to a great extent, um, typically. So the 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 master combination option just gives you the ability to process the data faster without 
without a lot of loss, let's say, in accuracy or, or um, the level of results that you need to complete a design with uh, with respect to code requirements. So, and a lot of times these these big multi-story projects tend to have a lot of combinations <laughs> and a lot of nodes. So, you know, that this one is a little bit streamlined, this model example, but when you get into something that a user has built, they tend to be a bit more uh, beefy in terms of, of computational time and requirements. All right. I appreciate everyone's time today. Um, if Again, if you have any questions outside of the meeting, feel free to contact us and we could explain or confirm anything that you had questions on. Um, but uh, again, happy holidays and thank you.